Hi, it's Lawrence Krauss, and I'm indoors today because I have no um, visual aids, and I can just sit here and talk to you, because what I want to talk to you about is perhaps the biggest disservice we do in talking about physics to beginning undergraduates. Um, because we present certain things, uh, we present physics kind of historically, where really physics is ahistorical. After the fact, you understand things in a way that makes it clear that all those tentative movements along the way were just tentative movements. And we present Newton's laws and F equals MA and sliding things sliding down planes. And then we get to this seeming miracle where there's a quantity called energy, which is conserved for, for no reason other than it sounds like a, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not violate energy conservation, we tell students. And indeed, when we examine colliding balls and cars and things moving around the earth, we discover that the energy, the total energy of these systems remains the same. In fact, most people remember the statement, energy cannot be created or destroyed, which is not quite true because energy can be converted into mass, so you realize mass is a form of energy. But in any case, we define that quantity and we don't explain why it's conserved. Similarly, we define a quantity called momentum, which is related to, any of you can think of it as sort of the, the, the oomph you feel when something hits you. If it, if it pushes you back, it had more momentum. But again, momentum is conserved, we say. And the conservation of energy and momentum together, after the fact we show, is equivalent to all of Newton's laws and all of classical mechanics. You can understand everything by just recognizing that energy is conserved and momentum is conserved. But these are pulled out of uh, a, a, the top hat as if by magic. In fact, what we really understand these things of are, is a result of a, of a mathematical statement that was produced by Emmy Noether, a mathematician uh, at the turn of the last century, one of the probably least heralded but mathematicians, but one of the most important mathematicians from the point of view of physics, because she changed the way we think about nature. The disconnect between introductory physics and modern physics that so many students feel when they get frustrated in first year physics, they don't feel they're doing anything related to modern physics. That disconnect is because we teach about energy and momentum the wrong way. We don't pull energy and momentum conservation out of a hat. We now understand them as due to what are called symmetries of nature. As Emmy Noether showed us, mathematically, whenever the laws of nature don't change as you change some quantity, that's a symmetry, then there's a conserved quantity. Let me make that a little clearer. The laws of physics don't change from day to day. They're invariant under time as far as we get, not as only as far as we can guess, we've actually measured it to see the laws of physics don't change from day to day. But according to Noether's theorem, the fact that the laws of physics don't change from day to day implies you must be able to derive a quantity, which we can call energy, which is conserved, which itself doesn't change. So the conservation of energy comes directly from the fact that the laws of nature are invariant under what we call time translation, day to day, that you don't need a new physics class every single day. The laws of physics are the same tomorrow as today, happily for many students. Similarly, the conservation of momentum can be understood as being a direct mathematical consequence of the fact that the laws of physics do not change from place to place that if I'm talking about physics here in my study, it's the same as if I'm talking about physics out on the deck or if I'm talking about physics somewhere else. Thankfully, you don't need a different physics class for every building in the university. The laws of physics are the same in every place. And that the fact that the laws of physics are translational invariant in space implies there must be a quantity, mathematically you can define, which we can call momentum. So momentum and energy conservation are direct reflections of fundamental symmetries of nature. There's another symmetry of nature. Uh, if you, One of the most symmetric things you can think of is a sphere, and I should have brought one here, but anyway, just a sphere is the same, looks the same no matter what you do. If you rotate it at all, it still looks identical. It's one of the most symmetric objects you can ever create. And the fact that the laws of nature don't change if you rotate your perspective is a direct, con uh, that symmetry produces another conservation law, something called angular momentum, that's conserved. And so, we, this, so all of basic classical mechanics can be understood in terms of energy conservation, momentum conservation, angular momentum conservation. And those three are not just invented, 
they were actually discovered, but we now understand that in fact they are implied, they must exist because of fundamental symmetries of nature, thanks to the work of Emmy Noether. Now what makes that particularly interesting is that bridges the disconnect between introductory physics and advanced physics. Because we now understand that when we're, if, if these symmetries of nature completely are equivalent to all the dynamics that Newton and others discovered, if you can derive exactly the same results, often much more easily, by using these conservation laws, conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum, we now understand as we look for new laws of physics to try and understand the, the world at extremes of scale, what we do is look for new symmetries of nature. And so the search for new laws of physics becomes equivalent to the search for new symmetries. And, and there is another symmetry, in addition to the ones I've described, that I, you can sort of understand, and that's a symmetry in electromagnetism, which has positive and negative charges. If I turned all the positive charges in nature into negative charges and all the negative charges into positive charges, the world would look largely the same. In fact, it's kind of an arbitrary convention, what I call positive and negative. For example, take a proton and electron, an electron orbiting a proton um, in, a, in a hydrogen atom. The proton, we say, has a positive charge, the electron has a negative charge. But if we said the proton had a negative charge and the electron had a positive charge, everything would look identical. That's a fundamental symmetry of nature, which was noticed and results in something called charge conservation. But it was discovered that there's actually a more subtle symmetry of nature. And I kind of can, I've described it in the past by using a chessboard. So let me try it described here. Take a chessboard with, pot, with white and black squares. I could switch the white and black squares. I could call, make the white squares black and the black squares white and then rotate the board by 90 degrees and the chessboard would look identical. The laws of the, the, the you'd still play chess. So the definition of what's white and black, a white king or a black king, etc., is just a convention. I could change white to black, black to white, and and everything works. That's like char that's like electric charge and electromagnetism. But there's something much more subtle I could do if I was devious. I could change the colors not globally, but in one place I could change a white to a black, and in another place keep the black the same, and another place change the black to white. And that, of course, would produce chaos unless I had a rule book. And I, I described from point to point what I'd done. And then if I described from point to point what I'd done, and I kept that rule book handy, I could play the same game of chess in this weird new board. The game of chess would not change as long as I kept the rule book handy. Well, in electromagnetism, it turns out I can show mathematically that I can change the definition of positive charge and negative charge, not just globally, but locally at each point in space differently. And the laws of physics remain the same as long as I keep that rule book that tells me how I change those charges. And it turns out the rule book gives you basically the electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field is the rule book that tells you that I could have changed the definition of charge locally and things remain the same. So, so the, this, this symmetry, which is a lot dif more difficult to describe in general, is called a gauge symmetry. But saying that nature is invariant under this gauge symmetry, if you work it out, tells you mathematically that you have to have what we now call as electromagnetism. The laws of electromagnetism are fixed uniquely by the requirement that the laws of nature are symmetric under this weird mathematical symmetry. Now that weird mathematical symmetry is worth talking about because we've discovered not just electromagnetism, but every one of the laws of nature we know of, electromagnetism, the strong force, the weak force, which is responsible for nuclear decays, and even gravity have a form of gauge invariance, as it's called. So all the forces in nature respect that kind of symmetry, and that governs our search for new forces in nature. So, the, so the, the pushing forward the laws of physics becomes equivalent to pushing forward the search for symmetries, even as it was in classical mechanics, but we never explain it that way. And so that's the connection between elementary physics and modern physics. And it's all due to Emmy Noether, the mathematics of this great mathematician um, who unfortunately uh, at the time couldn't achieve in some ways the at least the prominence as in her field as she might have, although all mathematicians knew of her, she wasn't able to get a professorship for the longest time because she was a woman. She actually moved to Göttingen uh, uh, um, under the request of the greatest mathematician of his era, David Hilbert, at the end of the 19th century. And he tried to get her a position, a, a paid position at the university, and uh, it turned out that humanities and philology professors said, no, we can't have a woman 
uh, professor, and, and David Hilbert said, this, this isn't a bathhouse, it's a university. Um, eventually that got changed and she was able to get a paid position, but just around that time in the 1930s, the Nazis came into power and they stopped allowing Jews to be professors in the university and she was Jewish and she was removed from her position there and eventually moved to the United States. Uh, she ended up teaching at Bryn Mawr, but unfortunately got cancer shortly after coming to the United States and died. But probably what Emmy Nerther did was more important for physics for our modern understanding of the world than almost any other mathematical result. Nurse's theorem governs the way we think about the world because we can now understand the world in terms of thinking for, of the symmetries of nature. And I think we do a disservice to our introductory physics students by not teaching classical mechanics in that way. Energy and momentum conservation are understood because the laws of physics are invariant under time and space. And that seems much more fundamental. Well, I hope that was clear, and uh, have a good day. Take care.